morning, everybody, and welcome to our next session of This Can Happen Insights. I am Zoe Sinclair, um, co-founder of This Can Happen Workplace Mental Health Conference, and I am delighted um, to welcome Paul Feeney. Uh, welcome back, should I say, Paul Feeney, as he spoke so eloquently and um, brilliantly at our conference in November 2019. Paul, good morning and welcome. Good morning, Zoe. Delighted to, to be here virtually. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Let's hope we all can stay on virtually as we've already had a few tech issues this morning. Um, so um, just to say to everybody, um, Paul and I are going to have a, a quick chat for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, but please feel free to send in any questions that you have. Um, they On your control panel, you should be able to see a question box. Feel free to send in any questions at any time. Um, they're completely anonymous. No one else can see your questions. Um, so please feel free to send in any questions and I will make every endeavor to ask Paul those questions. Okay, so Paul, diving straight in. Um, at the conference, you talked about and have done previously about mental health being um, the last great taboo um, in the city. Yeah. Um, I know you've worked in the city for over 30 years and you've had your own personal experiences that you speak very openly about. Do you think the current climate that we are living in is going to change that focus? Are we going to be able to move away from the last great taboo that is mental health in the city? Well, I really hope that it will. It will. I hope there will be some positive things that come out of this um, awful situation. Um, we had the World Health Organization only last week published a report saying that the next pandemic they're expecting is a mental health pandemic as a result of COVID-19, of isolation, of anxiety, and they mentioned the UK particularly in that. <clears throat> but at the same time, I think this, is, this environment is forcing us to think differently. It's forcing us to be more creative. Um, <clears throat> it's, for, it's forcing us to connect differently. You heard me say before, in a world where we're all instantly connected through technology, we've become less connected humanly. And this level of isolation, which is forced isolation as a result of COVID-19 crisis, is forcing us not only to connect through technology, but to connect at a more human level. Um, I open my window, I live in the middle of London, I open my window in my flat on a Thursday, and we all clap for the NHS as we, as we all do. I, I know more of my neighbours, although not I can't be physically close to them. Um, <clears throat> so it is forcing us to connect more to, at a human level, and it's forcing companies to think differently. And I think to start thinking really more about, gosh, purpose. Most companies have a purpose. Are they really staying true to that purpose? Um, because that's the why. And I think one of the issues that some of our younger people are struggling particularly with through this crisis is that they've struggled for for the why and the, remember the old, the old quote that person who has a why can suffer almost any how so it's focusing us more back on purpose um why companies exist and what we're doing to support our people and our customers and our communities so at quilter um you know what have you been doing that's been different obviously you've had to adapt to, to remote and i know you've got a, a you've got thrive ambassadors i believe you have internally but tell us a little bit about what you have been doing inside your company well first of all as you know i set myself um a personal goal when i floated when we floated the company nearly two years ago now two years next month um, to create the environment where our people can thrive. And that's where Thrive came from, which is a whole wellness program, um, mental health support, emotional, financial support for our, for our people. We've had to put that all online, virtually. So we have done that. We've put it all online. We've launched our, um, expanded our Thrive Hub. <clears throat> and we've also expanded it <clears throat> for not just our own employees now, but for all the financial advisors, which we launched this week, Thrive for Advisors. Who, who have their own clients that they have to support. So if you go on our Thrive Hub now, it's, there's podcasts, webinars, um, teach-ins on resilience through, through this um, crisis, um, looking after your mental health, staying fit, connecting through isolation. Um, <clears throat> there's there's um, webinars from 
from doctors, from psychologists, um, from everyday folk. And so to first of all is make sure that the resources are there. Secondly is all the training, the training for our Thrive ambassadors during this period of time, because of course they're also isolated through this period that they've got the support. So actually tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, I'm on a one of a webinar like this with um, about 20 or 30 of our of our Thrive ambassadors just to keep checking in. I'm trying to get, I'm personally trying to get around the company and meet all the team, our teams virtually. I can't do it physically. So I do it, I meet, I meet the teams, I meet maybe 10 teams a week um, through this sort of mechanism. And um, making sure that we're connecting, that people know that even though the team is now a virtual team, it's still a team and the support is still there for people. So people can still put their hand up and say, I'm not okay today. Yeah. And get the support. Okay. And, and have you been finding that during this time, people are saying, I'm not okay? Yeah, we have been finding that. Um, and we've been finding that, you know, you know that they're, they're doing it either through their line managers, to me directly, to whomever. People are, people are saying that they need a bit of support. Um, now, we have, as well as our, within our Thrive program, we have also our counseling program. So people can get, you know, they can get six, um, free counselling sessions with a professional psychologist and therapist. They can do that because there's a level, obviously, which we as colleagues can support each other, but there's a level beyond which people may need more professional help. So at the time when the NHS is is at breaking point in, in terms of its resources, we're making sure that we have that there for our, for our people too. And actually, it's something that we want to provide for advisors as well. And um, I was speaking to Chris Willard yesterday, who's a chief executive of the FCA, who was fantastic in in supporting us to be able be able to do this um, out in out in the open market. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, tell me a little bit about um, you've often spoken about the the macho culture that exists yeah. in the city. Are you seeing any change in that? in this short period of time or do you think there will be some kind of change yeah well i think one of the um <clears throat> you know what I'd, I'd like to say that i am seeing a, a change i'm seeing that um you know and it's not just in in the city but i think generally in the world we're seeing that the the tones um from leaders are, are changing somewhat people there's much more talk about compassion. If you listen to the prime minister, a lot of um, <clears throat> a lot of the presentation is talking about courage. Um, it's talking about um, compassion, kindness, support that we're all showing for each other, bravery. Um, <clears throat> so different people are using different words and different. They're speaking in different ways. So look, I don't think a macho culture changes overnight, um, but I think people are seeing that that sort of culture simply can't operate in this kind of environment. So the yeah. environment has yeah. changed. You know, I set myself, as I said, the goal of to create the environment where our people can thrive. Well, that is still absolutely my number one goal, but the environment has changed. Our workplaces have changed. Our workplaces have become our homes. Um, <clears throat> but it's not just the workplace which has changed. The environment has changed in, in terms of people realizing, gosh, you know, um, things that we talked about, things that we did a bit, have now become front and center in our lives. And when we come through this, I'm I'm certain that environmental, social governance, you know, low carbon society will become even more important. You know, people will realize, gosh, pollution pollution levels have dropped uh, through through this period of time. Why would we want them to rise again? You know, so I think it will be bring far more awareness and act action on things that we've all said have mattered but somehow we weren't able to really affect them yeah that's really interesting really interesting because you, you have also said that that there's a very big correlation you feel about financial well-being and mental health mental well-being and i just wondered whether you feel especially in the city you know finance driven 
whether that's going to be another aspect that is potentially going to affect more people with their mental health because we're going through or about to move into a huge financial crisis. Oh, Paul, I think you've frozen. Hello. Oh, yes, you're back. You might have I'm frozen. <laughs> you're back. Did you hear the question <laughs> that I asked? I sorry, sorry, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear the question. I just dropped off just as you were starting to speak. Don't worry. It's nice to know that even a CEO's internet can go down. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> um, no, what I was going to say is um, what what I asked was about um, the fine that you've often spoken about, um, and I remember clearly you saying this on on the stage of the conference about that correlation between financial well-being and mental health. And as we go through a, a start to go through a financial crisis potentially now, what effect that's going to have? I'm sorry, everyone. I think Paul is having problems maybe with the internet. He's gone off again. Just bear with us. Um, as he's not there, let's just wait a second. As I can just see, he has gone offline. Um, in the meantime, though, um, I can see all the questions you're sending in, so I will be coming to them in a second. Um, so just do bear with us. Um, yes. Um, Zoe, can you hear me? Ah, yes. Have you gone on the phone? I've got on the phone because this this has crashed twice now, so I thought it's best to at least get on the phone and we can, Fine. We can okay. speak. Fine, okay. So, unfortunately, you now can't hear Paul, but I can't see Paul, but we can hear you, and that is great. Paul, don't worry. So, the question was that um, you have spoken a lot about financial well-being and uh, the link to, to mental health. And I just wondered what you felt about the situation that we're in at the moment, heading towards a, a financial crisis or in one already. You know, what impact this is going to have on the city, uh, on your staff, on people that work in the city, um, and um, you know, elsewhere, not just the city. So, can I just check? You're talking. You're asking what um, effect will it have financially, or or? On mental health, on people's mental health, and how we how we're going to be able to support that, given that you talk a lot about the link between financial well-being and mental health. Um, well, um, I think. One second, we've, we've got, got this. Got this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I tell you what, keep speaking on the phone. I muted you. So hopefully, yeah. 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 Okay, can you hear me now, Zoe? I can hear you. Hello, Zoe, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so apologies for this. Well, look. <clears throat> In terms of the effect I think this will have on, on the city, I mean, financially, a lot of firms are, you know, um, I don't know many financial firms that are furloughing staff. Um, I don't know many financial firms at the moment who are taking government assistance. Certainly, we're not, we're not doing either of those things. Um, and we're supporting our staff through this. I think the main, I think some of the main effect that this will have on, on the city is, as, as I said earlier, it will focus companies and, as, and I think also individuals to think more about purpose, why. So, you know, our purpose is to create prosperity for the generations of today and tomorrow. So our customers, um, their families, our people, their families, are we doing that? How are we doing that? I think one of the things this, thing, this, uh, this crisis will, will do is force people to really look at their purpose, um, really look at whether they're paying lip service to it or whether they're really, really doing it. So, our, uh, and I think one of those issues is not just products and services, but also the culture that they create. Because, and I've spoken a lot about, you know, we spent a long time in Quilted thinking about what we wanted to be, the type of company we wanted to be. I think now it's focusing us on who we want to be. And I think 
it's focusing individuals more on who they want to be. You know, Paul, um, I just want to, in, sorry, just interrupt you for one second. I don't know whether you've got, that you haven't got the phone near your mouthpiece, uh, your, the phone near your mouth, because it's quite crackly. Okay, let me. Um, that seems better. Okay, one second. Um, can you hear me now? Is that better? That is good. Yes, that is really good. Excellent. Okay, like okay great. Moving. Okay, right. So um, I think it's focusing people more and companies more on who they want to be. And that comes down to culture, it comes down to values, um, it comes down to common purpose, a common purpose of what they're trying to what they're trying to achieve. So um, I hope that a lot of companies will, I, I believe they will, but I hope that a lot of companies will focus back more on that, on their common purpose and whether they're really their role in society. What is the purpose of the company? Most products can be replicated. Um, I mean, it, let's take my industry, the financial services industry. You know, nobody needs another mutual fund. There are tens of thousands of mutual funds in this country. Nobody needs another pension product. There are thousands of them. You know, <clears throat> so if you, so it's not about product. It's about it's about helping people and making a difference. So are your, is your company actually helping people and making a difference? And I think, um, I hope as we come through this, there'll be a lot more focus on that um, from the yeah. city and financial services companies. Yeah, hugely interesting. Okay, so I'm going to turn now to some questions that we've got coming in from, um, from the audience. There, there's lots coming in. Um, so somebody has said, um, why do you think most other CEOs and business leaders do not open up about their own mental health struggles or vulnerabilities? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I don't, I think some do for a start, by the way. I think there are, there are a number of them that are very supportive and um, uh, feel this is a very important area. I think, don't, don't forget, CEOs often <laughs> can, Many CEOs, from my experience, are kind of alpha, alpha people, and they've they've succeeded or they've you know got to that position by strength of will and what have you. Um, um, a number of a number of them are diff are different, but I think that's one one issue. I think also, in a way, they're very competitive. You know, we work in a very competitive environment, um, and it probably hasn't got onto the, the board agenda. I mean, we all, obviously in, in the public markets, we all operate on quarterly reporting cycles. You're only as good as your next half year's profits. You know, um, and there has been this you know, focus on numbers and focus on measuring. You know, we all measure stuff. We, we measure our earnings per share. We measure our profits. We measure our sales. We measure our growth. Measurement, measurement, measurement. How do you measure your mental health? <laughs> now, and I think yeah. in a strange way, un until we do start measuring it, it won't become part of the fiber of many, of many companies, many financial services companies. <clears throat> there has to be some level of measurement, but it's a different, obviously it's a different type. It's a wellness measurement um, that we have. So we monitor, we monitor it a lot. We use a thing called, called PECON, but which is simply getting we do that weekly um, through this through this crisis, where we get feedback from all of our from our staff on a weekly basis. They can put comments, they can identify themselves or not identify themselves. Um, but a lot of the questions we we ask now have changed. They're, they've changed to try and reflect: Are people okay? What would help? Are we helping? Are there other things we could do? How do you feel today? You know. Um, so there has to be some level of measurement. Well, and, and that information that you collect, because I can see people are asking about that and not something they've heard of before, that information you collect goes to somebody who then looks at it all and I suppose analyzes it to see how you can help? Yeah, it comes, it comes back, it comes into a, um, a centrally, but we all get it. I get it sent. I get all the feedback every, every week. My executive team do every week. Um, it's our job to make sure that we respond. Now, we don't respond to you know, some people are just, <clears throat> some people would simply just get a straight measurement. Others 
will be um, very insightful comments. So every manager has to look at the, the feedback from their, from their teams. They, don't, they can't identify, uh, I mean, the teams are determined by a minimum number of people, so they don't necessarily know which one has, has said it, unless that person wishes to self-identify. But all of us have to, have to respond. Um, and people know, one of the reasons why people use it and our staff, our colleagues use it, is that they know they will be responded to. As opposed to nothing worse than doing this and then deafening silence. Absolutely. That's a hugely useful piece of information, I think, for um, people on this call. Um, somebody um, um, has asked, and I, I just wonder what tools you're giving your Thrive ambassadors, because um, somebody has asked a question here that is uh, that they, they are what they call a mental health champion. I can imagine the same sort of thing as your Thrive ambassadors. And they've said, mm -hmm. one thing I found challenging as a mental health champion is no longer having visibility in the office. Of those people that reached out to me uh, previously, it was when I was in the office. So what tools are you providing your ambassadors, your Thrive ambassadors, to um, for people to still be able to reach out to them? Yeah. <clears throat> well, first of all, it's just pragmatic tools. So we use... Um Microsoft Teams. Uh, we use Microsoft Teams, we use Zoom, we use GoToMeetings, although clearly not me very well at the moment, but, but we use mainly those, uh, those mechanisms. I've got a big meeting, as I said, tomorrow, um, team meeting, Microsoft Team meeting with um, quite a lot of our Thrive ambassadors. So first of all, it's checking in with them. They've all had their training, that they've got the We've placed everything now digitally online, all the resource, resource kits online. Um, a lot of it is them reaching out and checking with other, just checking in to see. I have people checking in on me. A, a, a young man checked in on me, of one of my colleagues um, yesterday, just saying, Paul, how are you doing? You know, yeah. <clears throat> brilliant just to get, that, to get that call. So I think, Again, it's not rocket science. The the resources, if you like, the well-being toolkits are all there on our on our Thrive platform. Um, our Thrive ambassadors have had that 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 training, um, but at the same time, they they're not able themselves to get together physically like they used to. So they will use the um, they'll have their own uh, video check-in meetings amongst themselves, and then also with me and with other members of um, the leadership team. So we do that regularly. As I say, I've got one at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Yeah. Okay. And and on that basis, um, Paul, can I ask, you know, how have you been looking after your own mental well-being at this time? Have you f found that lockdown has been challenging for you, or how have you managed? It has been challenging for me. I'm one of different people react differently. Some people through this are finding, gosh. They really like the working from home environment. Um, they are less keen that may, maybe to go back to what was the old way of office working. Other people are finding it more difficult. <clears throat> I'm one of the ones who are who's finding it more difficult. Um, you know, being confined is is uh, you know it's not um, it's not my preferred modus operandi. Um, so what am I doing? I'm doing the things I know that that help me. One is I'm getting exercise every day. I, I live in central London, so I tend to loop around Hyde Park once a day. I know every squirrel by name now. And mm -hmm. um, so I, I, get, I get fresh air, I get exercise. I make sure that I, I check in um, with the people that I know I find support from. Um, my partner, obviously, um, but also at work that I'm, I'm also doing the things that I'm, I'm, I'm saying other people can do so our thrive hub i look at our the podcasts on our on our platform our thrive platform particularly around resilience uh particularly about keeping healthy during this period of time um <clears throat> so i do that i mean i i, I when i can I, I try to read um what i can i get people send me <laughs> send me books i've just read an incredible book um very short only like 140 pages um by a gentleman called uh, Jean Dominique Bauby um, called the diving bell and the butterfly. It's all about this. It's an autobiography, his autobiography. Um, he had a 
massive stroke at the age of 43 and was left with locked in syndrome, completely paralyzed. And he wrote this book, user, typing out, well, uh, signaling letters only with his left eyelid. Um, and he wrote the book. And it's one of the most inspiring, uplifting things I've ever read. Um, and it just shows you, you know, that you can create a life for yourself in the most appalling circumstances. So we're trying to work through being locked down. He had to live through being locked in. And I think understanding that makes you realize how much further as you know, human beings we can go. So I think <clears throat> using, you know, using different resources, checking in, keeping healthy, um, try not to drink too much wine. Well, that, that's, that's, uh, I'm failing on that one. Um, <clears throat> and I'm making sure that, you know, I seek it, you know, seek knowledge from, from different places. Okay, great. Um, just one or two more questions here. Um, how, so this is obviously someone who isn't in your position um, yet, but how do we inspire our leaders to make employee well-being as important as profit-growing activity? Um, <clears throat> how do we make our leaders, I've always said you've got to make it personal. You know, um, somebody has to challenge, people have to challenge their leaders. So, you know, you can't wait for necessarily for, sometimes it's simply awareness. It's not, you know, most leaders lead not because they're in a position that people have to do as they're told. That's just a manager. Most leaders lead because people follow. That's the only way you can lead. If nobody follows, you're not leading anything. <clears throat> So people follow people they believe in, you know, and often they'll follow when they don't fully understand or even fully see what that leader sees. But if they believe in her or they believe in him, they'll follow. And that's, and that's leadership. <clears throat> so I think it's a time to call people out. You have to call your leaders out. If you don't feel that, that it's happening, you have to call them out. Um, make them aware. Um, and I think fundamentally as well, you know, one of the things that I, I try and do is also talk to our shareholders and tell our shareholders what we're doing and why we're doing it. You know, so why are we launching our Thrive program to the whole advisor market? That's costing us a lot of money. We won't make any money out of it. So explaining to our shareholders, listen, we're building a sustainable business. You know, when we come through this, you know, again, I, and it's not, it's not philanthropy, it's business. When we come through this, I want our customers, our staff, our financial advisors who support us out there in the market to say, you know what? You know the firm who really helped us all through this? Quilter. Now, so I don't think there's any reason <clears throat> why, you know, and good business and mental well-being shouldn't be one and the same thing. Yeah. And I think probably that's a that's a really great way to end. Um, and in fact, sort of final thoughts from you, um, bringing all full circle again. You know, what are your hopes? Looking positively at the situation that we're in at the moment, what mm -hmm. what, what are the positives that we hopefully, with regards to mental well-being, that we can take away from this pandemic that we're living through? Well, I think it, there are so many para, um, paradoxes. Is that, is that a word, paradoxes? Yeah. <laughs> There's so. a lot of para the paradoxes uh, coming out of this. That <clears throat> isolation is bringing us more, is bringing us closer together. Um, <clears throat> but there's there's truth in that. Um, that um, when we can't be, you know, we're finding more connectivity humanly. Um, that when there have been so much talk of walls and barriers and boundaries, even though we're, <clears throat> there has to be isolation to try and co contain and overcome the virus, most people now are realizing the only way you tackle this is through working together. This thing can't be tackled on a individual national level. It can only be tackled on a, on a global human level. And people are realizing, gosh, 
that's true for so many other things too. So I think I think what's happening, I think it's it will bring greater awareness. It will reprioritize what's important. People will realize sustainability isn't just about profits and competition. <clears throat> you know, it's about well-being. Fundamentally, what are we trying to do with companies? Companies only support people fundamentally. Fundamentally, they sell their stuff to people. So companies exist, really, to help people. Um, <clears throat> and I think, when, when, I think there'll be greater awareness of that. And companies, the leaders of companies will have to say, gosh, we've got to change the way we've been doing things. Yeah. Well, here's hoping. And um, Paul, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this morning and um, you are you know certainly um, a, an inspirational leader for us all to hear from so thank you very much for, for being part of this Can Happen Insights this morning and um, thank you everyone for joining us as well. Thank you Zoe. Um, pleasure and um, have a good rest of your day and we hope to see you again on all very soon. Thanks so much I'm now going to end. Thanks. Thank you Zoe. Bye-bye.